And speaking of education, students, especially those who are maybe juniors or seniors getting ready to take their SATs or just preparing, studying right now to take those SATs, can expect something new this year. So for the first time ever, the SATs are going to be digital. So I actually spoke to the National Testing Association about the first ever digital SATs kicking off this year. Everything from what parents need to know to what students need to know and kind of why they decided to go digital. This is going to be the first time ever that students are taking this digital SAT. I know when I took the test back in high school before I got into college, you sat down with the paper and the pencil, you were filling in the little bubbles. So how is this going to be a little bit different for students who are getting ready to prepare for those tests? It's a great question on how the digital SAT is going to be different. So all the benefit or all the changes to the digital test should benefit students. So it's shorter. Instead of being three hours, it's now two hours and 14 minutes. It also gives students the option of using an on-screen digital graphing calculator so they don't need to bring their own calculator. And the reading sections are much shorter. So instead of reading 750 passages, students will on average get 75 word passages and just have one question to answer on that shorter passage. But what students also need to understand is just because the passages are shorter and students get more time per question, it doesn't mean the questions are any easier. So actually the short passages that have one question, those questions still require very strong critical reading skills. And the math questions, if anything, have just gotten harder, even though there are fewer of them. And the test also adapts to students to give the students more appropriately difficult questions for their skill level. So a very strong student will end up getting harder questions and a not as strong student will actually get easier questions as the test adapts to that ability level. Wow. So that's really interesting, the whole question aspect of it. But why exactly do you think this change was made? Is it just because technology is becoming greater and greater now that it's 2024? Or do you think it's because they found that doing something digital is going to better set students up for success? I think the College Board made the change because, just as you said, the technology allows them to make a better testing experience. So if you just have a paper-based test, you have to give even the strongest students a lot of easy questions to just make sure that they're getting all the easy ones right. But with an adaptive test, once they've gotten all the easy, medium, and hard questions correct, you don't need to keep giving them more easy questions like you do on a paper test. You can just get rid of the, all those easy questions for them. Same thing for a student who's getting all the hard questions wrong. Why continue to give them more hard questions that they're just going to get wrong? Just give them medium and easy questions. So that technology allows the test makers to get an equally valid score with fewer questions. And that's really helpful to students who then have to take a 45 minute uh, shorter test, which is just great on a Saturday morning. Yeah, for sure. So any advice for let's say students or parents who are trying to prepare their students for this new form of testing? So students and parents, they need to understand that although the format of the test has changed, the test is still testing the same fundamental concepts. So as long as students are learning grammar and reading and mathematics, they're going to be able to improve their scores. And we're really in the golden age of information. So all students can access quality test prep for free through Khan Academy. That's all free SAT test prep online. They can also get more, um, you know, very inexpensive prep books that they can get, you know, uh, at any bookstore or online. And then they can also go to classes or get private tutoring. For instance, I'm from the National Test Prep Association. We have the largest group of vetted expert tutors in the country. So really, however students learn best, they have access to that information. And all students, by getting a better score, they can do better on their tests, get into better colleges, and get more scholarships. Awesome. Anything else that um, you want to add? Is there, so since there is a digital calculator 
are students not allowed to bring in their own anymore? Like, is there any new rules or anything like that? Or can they still bring in their own calculator if they feel more comfortable doing that? That's a great question. So students can still bring in their own calculator. And that there are some banned calculators, but almost any calculator will do. But if they feel more comfortable with their calculator, definitely bring that in. What my students do is they bring in their own calculator. They do most of the calculations on their personal calculator. But then that graphing calculator that students get access to is actually a more powerful calculator than the graphing calculator you would bring in. So it's quite frankly better than the expensive calculators you can even buy. So students can still benefit from their own calculator, but certainly they don't need to worry if they don't have a calculator, they're not at a disadvantage. What a lot of families are kind of freaking out about is the fact that Yale, Dartmouth, Brown, and UT Austin have now gone back to test required admissions. And families are wondering, well, how does this impact my child's admissions chances or scholarship chances now that in their minds, tests have become more important again. What is very helpful for families to know, though, is this is more of a, a change in name only. So Yale, for instance, last year when it was test optional, students who submitted test scores had a three times higher admit rate if they submitted test scores. So even under test optional admissions, they were functionally test required. So what families should understand is all of those highly selective schools even if they say they're test optional, most of them are functionally test required. For instance, Duke, 93% of students at Duke who are enrolled submitted test scores. That's not very test optional. So yes, students absolutely have the option not to submit test scores and they can still apply. But if they actually want to get in, then that's not really optional to submit test scores when there's usually three times higher three times higher admit rates for students who submit scores. And the same is true of getting merit aid and scholarships. There are a lot of schools that will give you automatic scholarships if you hit certain scores. So some schools will literally over four years give you over $100,000 in automatic scholarships that you don't even need to apply for. You just automatically get them with a certain SAT or ACT score. But without an SAT or ACT score, you can't get those scholarships. So again, even if a school says it's test optional, really look at the school, see what percent of their enrolled students submitted test scores or not, no matter what good test scores help you get in and get more money from the school.